Well, good morning, or good afternoon now, actually, isn't it? I was having a conversation with somebody just before this part of the service started, and uh, they said, if you're any more than five minutes, we will walk out. Uh, it reminds me of a film I saw once called Spaceballs, where they do this wedding, and they have to cut it down and down and down until it's, uh, do you? Yes. Do you? Yes. Right, you're married. Get out. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and so this will be that version of, of this sermon. Hopefully, somebody will get something from this, maybe. So this miracle comes in a second in a series of lots of accounts about Jesus' authority. Jesus shows he's got authority over nature, authority over death, uh, authority over illness, and in this situation, authority over and in the face of pure evil, the demonic. And this miracle is a full account of the events. We have Jesus being presented with the problem, Jesus delivering the demon-possessed man, And then a a follow-up conversation with the man as well, and as well as the people's reaction, the people in the area's reaction. And so what does it say about this man who was possessed by many demons? It says that this man had many demons that seized him, a man who was naked, a man who lived in tombs, a man who was bound by shackles, yet was strong enough to break free as a result of his demonic influence. This man was an outcast. He almost certainly had bloody broken skin and was bruised by demonic seizures. In fact, in Mark's version, it talks about the fact that he actually hurt himself, bruised himself with stones. And yet, when this seemingly unassuming rabbi from Nazareth turns up, the whole situation changes. There is deliverance, and then we have the reactions of the people in that that situation. But the point is, when Jesus turns up, Nothing stays the same. And one of the reasons this miracle is so important, can speak to us in a number of different situations, is that it concerns something that we all crave at times, something that sometimes we might even feel lost without, and that is control, being in control. It's interesting that we have a display of control and a, reaction to, and a reaction to authority. Legion, the many demons, the people in the region, and of course Jesus. Two of the groups in this particular miracle are seeking control. They want control, but only one person has authority. There's the control desired by Legion. When Jesus uh, has a confrontation with Legion and then is, is about to cast him out, Legion tries to negotiate the best possible deal. Don't send me into the abyss. There is this striving and negotiation for control for a power struggle uh, in that situation. After Jesus has delivered the man, the people in the area also want control. They want control because they actually want Jesus to kind of leave them be. In the face of the power of God, in the face of Jesus, are we upset by what God is doing? Do we think, no, do you know what? Life was cosy without this man, Jesus, messing things up for me. And, of course, the people say they ask Jesus to go, and so Jesus does what they want. We often want control. I uh, have a testimony from my own life, actually from Charlotte, my wife's life, that uh, I was desperate for her to become a Christian, praying for her for many, many months. And uh, when it came to the point that we went to a Christian festival and there was a a kind of typical altar call, if anybody doesn't know the Lord, then come forward and, and get prayed for. And I was sitting down next to Charlotte, and then suddenly she shot bolt upright. And instead of the initial reaction of joy that I thought I would experience, I experienced fear, and I experienced slight worry, because I was no longer the most important person in her life. And that was just hard. And I watched her go forward, and I was thinking, this is amazing. But... For a man, it's like, wow, I'm I'm no longer the God of her life. Actually, God's the God of her life. Somebody somebody said, actually, the difference between God and me is that God never thinks that he's me. So we have this situation of different factions, people wanting control. And what is the message, really, of this? The one that had authority... 
Jesus' authority does not need to, need to aspire to another position of, of greatness. Control is about effort and force. Control is an aspiration to grasp at a position that you don't rightly own. Authority is ingrained in the very identity and being of who Jesus is. Control is concerned with self-serving. In authority, Jesus is completely free to serve and benefit others without worrying about status. It's a complete contrast. So know whose authority you stand in today. Know that Jesus holds the authority over our lives and that we are secure in him. You know, one of the reasons we see God getting so angry with Moses in the Exodus story was not because of Moses' lack of self-confidence. It was because of Moses' lack of God-confidence. Know whose authority you stand in today. Who holds the authority over your life? Or do we still sometimes wonder whether God's word for us still stands, where we've had words of knowledge or prophecy, or whether we've, it's just about our salvation? Do we question that, or do we stand in it and know that God's authority is eternal? Do we believe that his grace is sufficient? It's interesting, as I come to a close, that actually there was another situation in Jesus' life on earth where he faced a multitude. Obviously, we've got him facing potentially a thousand demons in this situation, which is why he was called Legion. There is another situation of the, that Jesus faced this multitude, and this was in the Garden of Gethsemane, where there was a detachment of Roman soldiers. And I don't know if you know anything about Roman history, but a detachment of soldiers could have been around 500 soldiers. We never see these pictures of the Garden of Gethsemane in this way. We see Judas Iscariot and a few people. John's Gospel says there was a detachment, which is a lot of armed, trained killers, actually, if we're being blunt about it. And it says in John 18, the group led by Judas Iscariot say that they were looking for Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus replies, I am he. And when Jesus says this, the detachment and the others are flawed. And I don't mean flummoxed or confused. I mean they were knocked to the ground. The words of Jesus, I am, was enough to knock them over. But then Jesus does something amazing. Jesus, who has both authority and control, lays aside his authority, lays aside any kind of control, and he humbles himself, as Paul writes, and becomes obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so we are able to be in the authority of God, under the authority of God, the authority of God that is not just any old authority, but pure, loving authority, that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, as Paul says in Romans. So walk in that today. Walk in the peace of the authority, not the desperation and struggle of control. That's why Jesus went through what he did, so we can be under that authority and operate in that authority. The assurance of total forgiveness, future hope, life-changing freedom, walking under the shield of his authority and love, so that we can say in the words of John Wesley, my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amen.